Welcome to this episode. We're going to talk about emergency management for the fire service. Now some of you may be asking why is that important? Well, if you look at the major incidents that have occurred within the United States, you'll see that in many cases emergency responders are typically the fire service and law enforcement. So we want to talk for a few minutes about why is emergency management important and how do we apply it to the fire service. Now I've got some key objectives I want to make sure we address. First, we want to define what is emergency management and what are the components of the emergency management cycle. Second, we want to take a look at explaining what the preparation phase of it is. As well, the next one we want to take a look at is explain how do we respond to an emergency or disaster of this nature. In many cases, we're talking a very large scale incident. We then want to talk about uh, the recovery process. How do we uh, take care of that as far as uh, an emergency uh, fire service goes? And finally, mitigation. And mitigation is going to be a critical part that we want to talk about because it takes place in so many parts of the disaster. Now, again, the fire service is typically the first group that comes in. When we have a hurricane come through, a major tornado, uh, earthquake, whatever the case may be, and even today with a terrorist incident, all of these are situations where the fire service is going to typically be the first one on the scene. And in many states, what you typically find is that the fire chief is the incident commander of these type of incidents. So we really want to get a good understanding, a good basic understanding. And again, what we're going to be talking about here are the basics. So if you're looking to expand your knowledge of this, you're looking to go further, definitely begin doing research and looking further into what emergency management is. Now the first thing we want to define is what is a disaster. We want to make sure we have a common definition that we're working from. Now the reason I say that is because a disaster can be very subjective. What's considered a disaster for me may not be for you. And it may be totally different for another person. So we want to make sure we're working off the same page. Now a disaster is defined as a sudden event such as an accident or natural catastrophe that causes great damage or loss of life. Now it sounds pretty straightforward, but let's take a car accident for example on the side of the interstate. We'll, we'll use that. Now it may be a minor fender bender. It may be something small, not a lot of damage, nobody injured. Now to the responders, it's a run-of-the-mill call, nothing major. To the person who's going through the incident, it's a major problem. It's a, it stops their day significantly. And so the definitions become a little bit different. So we're going to work off the same definition here. As I said, a sudden event, such as an accident or a natural catastrophe, that causes great damage or loss. Now, what, we're, what would be some examples of that? An example would be Hurricane Katrina. And you take a look at how that impacted the Gulf Coast area. And in that situation, we had a, a great loss of life. We had a lot of damage. And we had significant problems as a result of dealing with that incident. Now, one of the questions that typically is brought up is if, for example, a tornado moves through a rural area, there's no damage to property, there's no damage to people, it's a uh, pretty much takes out a few trees and we're, we're done. Is that considered a disaster? By, well, by our definition here, it probably wouldn't be because the response is totally different if there is any in this situation. However, you take an earthquake moving through Los Angeles. Not, yeah, earthquake going through Los Angeles. In that situation, there's damage to buildings. There possibly could be injuries, loss of life, those type of things. In that situation, it then becomes a disaster. So you need to define this very clearly. We need to make sure we're working off the same page on this. Bottom line of what we're dealing with here today and what we're going to be talking about are incidents that either have a large amount of damage or loss of life. In those situations, these are what we're going to be looking at and reviewing as we go through this particular segment. Now, from the standpoint of emergency management, there are systems set up in place just like there is for the fire service. So, for example, if we talk about what make creates a fire, we're going to talk about the fire triangle. And you've got to have the oxygen, you've got to have the fuel, and you've got to have the ignition source. So those are things you've got to have for a fire. Uh, the same thing applies for emergency management. There's a process in place. And the, they, talk, they call it the disaster life cycle or the phases of a disaster. You'll hear different terms that are involved there, but very similar and along the same lines. And emergency management says there are basically four phases of the life cycle for a disaster. There's first, mitigation. 
Second, there's preparation. Third is the response. And then fourth, we have the recovery. So those are four things to really make sure you ingrain in your memory. And as you talk with emergency managers or you talk with other responding agencies, these are terms that will come up quite regularly. Now, here's one of the issues that occurs when we talk about these four phases. Uh, people typically think of it as a very linear approach. So we have step one, mitigation. We have step two, preparation. Step three, response. And then we have step four, recovery. And in many, in many cases, it doesn't operate like that. In many cases, what you'll see is it becomes more of a circular approach where we may start with mitigation and then it circles into preparation, response, and recovery, and then cycle back into mitigation. And some folks, what they will tell you is they'll tell you that mitigation actually takes place in the center because it happens in all of these phases. And we're going to talk about that as we get into that particular segment. So the key to remember at this point, though, is that there are four phases to a disaster. And the first is mitigation, then preparation, then response, then recovery. But if you recall from the previous slide, one of the things we, we want to make very clear is that when you talk about the phases of a disaster, you're not talking about a linear approach necessarily. What, we're, what I want to make sure you understand is that it does tend to happen in a more circular fashion. And that in many cases, actually what you'll begin to see is that some of these phases will begin to bleed over into each other. And oftentimes, particularly mitigation, you begin to see in different areas. It will apply throughout. And for example, if we, have a, if we have a major incident occur or a major disaster occur, initially you're going to have the response. Uh, obviously, as, as departments come in, as agencies come in to get involved in the incident, to help out, and so forth. Where, it, uh, where the response ends and where the recovery phase begins may not be necessarily clear. You may find this to be a very gray area. So putting these into boxes, so to speak, and saying, okay, we've completed the mitigation step. We're now moving into the preparation step. All right, we're now done with the preparation and we're now going to recovery. It doesn't happen like that in most cases. And, and most of the time what you will see is there's actually more of a blending of when these occur. Now, as I said, the mitigation begin, it can actually take place in any of these. So, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Let's first start with what is it. Uh, mitigation are activities that we perform to either prevent the occurrence of the emergency or minimize the damage. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for ways to begin to minimize. Compare it very similar to either um, your fire prevention, compare it to uh, inspections, any of those things that uh, may help reduce the number of fires. Mitigation does the same thing for disasters, for um, the incidents that may occur within our communities. And so these are things you're going to want to put in place to help try to reduce the number of uh, either the level of damage or the number of fatalities that may occur from a disaster. So uh, some of the terms you'll typically hear in here are things like risk assessment, risk analysis, uh, any, any of those terms that are looking to reduce the level of damage and uh, risk to the community. So these are what we're, lo that we're looking for. As well, what we're going to look at as well in, under mitigation is, is things that we can do to reduce the vulnerability of a community. Now, uh, for example, I'll use the May 3rd tornadoes. Uh, May 3rd, 1999, um, Oklahoma uh, was hit with some the worst tornadoes of the century. And in many cases, some of the communities, while there was a lot of notice sent out, they just didn't have the resources to respond to uh, that level of a storm. And so there was significant damage to many communities. And there were uh, actually neighborhoods in Oklahoma City that people just walked away and left their homes. Uh, no, no notice or anything like that. There was just so much damage and so much going on there. And so at, in the mitigation phase, what we're going to look for is we're, we're trying to figure out ways to minimize that. And so what you should be able to see in, in, these, in, in this situation is that actually mitigation is going to take place as we prepare for an incident or a disaster, as we respond, and particularly in the recovery. 
because as we're recovering and coming back to uh, trying to come back to some type of normal environment or where we were before we're going to look for ways to improve so that the next disaster that comes through or the next tornado that comes through will be will create less damage all right we just talked about mitigation in that particular phase of the disaster cycle and in many cases you'll find that this is typically listed first now what we want to talk about is preparation and preparation uh, by definition involves activities that are undertaken in advance of an emergency we've now been given the notice we have a hurricane moving in or we may have storms coming in that could be tornadic we may have an impending earthquake that we know is coming those type of situations we we know the incident is coming and now we've got to start getting ready for it and this is where we begin to rally together our resources and this is where we begin to put together the pieces that we need to make sure we can respond to it effectively these are situations where typically you will see uh, the, the emergency operations centers begin to come up and everybody begin to come online getting ready for the storm uh, you may see uh, fire departments begin to move their resources to a safer location uh, waiting for the storm to pass you may also see law enforcement begin to work with uh, getting the evacuation process moving and so forth and the notification processes uh, all of that begins to come into play and begins to uh, move so this is what the preparation phase is doing alright well, what when we talk about preparation I want to break it down a little bit further for you there are a number of things that begin to take place and that we want to make sure occur in the preparation phase now the first one begins to talk as we look at this is the normal operations and these are situations where we may have distant notice that a storm's coming in we may have distant notice that an earthquake's getting ready to occur or a tornado and we're beginning to prepare ourselves for that type of incident and here we're talking very general we're not talking specifics at this point we're talking very very general and what we'll do in the normal operations of preparation is first we'll begin to develop and revise our disaster plans and our hazard analysis and this this begins to is an ongoing thing throughout the year and I think this is a mistake often that you see occur is that we think that okay we've created our disaster plan and we've got all of that in place the pieces we need okay let's go put it on the shelf and not look at it again until the disaster occurs and and this can leave you pretty well blindsided if you never go back and revisit your disaster plan or your hazard analysis or things like that you always want to begin to look for ways you can continue to improve your response and how you're going to handle a major disaster so always make sure that this takes place on a regular basis it doesn't have to happen every day but it, it, it needs to happen at a regular occurrence as well in this part of the process as we said mitigation takes place at all parts of the uh, disaster phases so mitigation can be a part of this because what's going to happen is as you're beginning to develop your plans, as you're looking for ways to improve your response, what you're also going to look for way, things to do is look for ways to minimize the impact. And so while we, we we're writing our plans, we may look for ways to improve our building codes. We may look for ways to improve uh, our evacuation routes and things like that that are going to occur. We also want to make sure we put in place are any mutual aid agreements we may need. Anything that you may need to ensure that the other resources are coming. You want to get those in place and have those agreements already established so that everybody knows their role. Uh, one of the big uh, headaches that you typically see for the incident commander are the sudden influx of people coming in to an incident and typically you see this with volunteers you see this with uh, community members from other parts of the country and so forth when there's a major disaster everybody kind of wants to help and they want to be a resource the issue though is if these mutual aid agreements if these operational plans are not in place it becomes a free-for-all so you want to make sure those things are well established as well and so we've got our emergency our, our disaster plans we've got our hazard analysis we've done some of our mitigation as part of this process and we've got our mutual aid agreements in place now the next thing we want to do during this normal operations phase is the most one of the most critical parts and that's to make sure we're training on it and you know as any type of firefighter training they'll tell you the more you do a skill the more you practice it the greater the likelihood 
that it's going to become a natural part of you and a natural uh, reaction. So just like we did with our, our basic firefighter training, just like we do with officer development, any of those pieces, uh, our disaster response needs to be practiced and drilled. So uh, train, as well, what I would also suggest is that you also train with other departments. The people that are coming in that have those mutual aid agreements in place with you, have them come in as well as part of the training. And so that way everybody gets to know each other, everybody knows how the other works, and you can begin to work together as a team. As well, what I would also, also what I would try to put in place is that even part of your regular firefighter training that you go through each, each month, try to begin to tie in some of these pieces of the disaster response and your disaster plan so that people can become more and more familiar with them. <clears throat> the other piece we want to make sure is we want to take a look at our public information as well as our communication systems. If you, if you look at any post-incident analysis, if you look at the one thing that always, it typically comes up so, too many times is the issue of communication. Whether that be with the general public, whether that be with uh, people on the scene, any of those type things, typically communication is the part that breaks down. Now you may, you may be thinking, well wait a minute, we talk all the time. Some of the folks in our department may talk too much. <laughs> so we want to look, <laughs> those are situations, but in a situation where there's a crisis, there's a disaster where we're having to deal with it, uh, the communications can be a real issue. And you want to make sure that you have, as part of your disaster plan, as part of your natural operation, you want to make sure that communication is a big part of it. And that, that, that does not just within your department, but as well to the general public. And make sure that those things are being taken care of as well. Uh, then finally, as part of this normal operations, you want validation that your plan's working, that people are properly trained to deal with it, that your mutual aid agencies are effectively working with you. So you want to try to run an exercise. I would recommend at least annually. Once a year, you pull everybody in, and you run your exercise and you evaluate it. And what you want to look for are did, are did all the pieces work like they're supposed to? So did, did it, was everybody able to respond effectively? Did they get the communications they needed effectively? Were there breakdowns in, in communication with each other that we need to work on? Uh, were there skills that we need to build up in preparation for an incident? And these are all things you want to look at. Uh, how well did our command staff work together? How well did the EOC operate? How, what are some ways we can improve this? Pulling all these pieces together, you could, it becomes a continuous improvement. And as you're preparing to deal with you, these other areas, you begin to learn how are we going to operate. And this unfortunately doesn't always occur. So you may, again, going back to what I said earlier, you see they created the disaster plan, they put it on the shelf, they don't look at it again until the incident occurs. And if you don't do that, you don't know if it works. You won't have any idea until the incident occurs and by then it's too late. At that point, everything's in motion and everything's moving and you don't have the time to go back and reevaluate to say, okay, can we revise our disaster plan now? So the key things in the normal operations in pre preparation for a disaster are you want to make sure your, your disaster plans are well, well, well written and in place. You want to make sure that your mutual aid agreements are in place and already established, that you're, you're training your personnel on how to respond to these disasters based on your, your disaster plan and based on your mutual aid agreements. And then finally, the other things you want to look at is you want to take a strong look at your communication. And you also want to take a look at run the exercises to see if everything works. All right, to sum things up for us when we talk about the preparation phase. There are several things, and particularly in normal operations, is that we want to take a look at several key, area, several key areas. Uh, first, we want to look at our plans themselves. Typically, when things go wrong or you have a problem at a major disaster, is, uh, one of the big key issues is our disaster plans are out of date or they haven't been revised or they haven't kept up. That's the first key area that you typically see issues occur. Uh, the second part is communications. Communications plays a big one because I, I hear that so many times both in small incidents and large incidents. And it's not a situation where you hear a person say, you know, bring out 
specifically the communication was an issue, what you typically hear is we did not get that information to respond or to handle that component of the, the, the response. Uh, we didn't get the information we needed or I wasn't clear on what you were trying to explain to me. Those are the type of statements you typically hear. From the general public side on communications, it's an issue of what you typically hear, and you hear this in the news media, so if, in addition to us seeing it, they, the media also sees it, is that you'll see that people say, well, I didn't know I was supposed to evacuate, or I didn't realize the storm was going to be that bad. And that's a very common one you do here. I did not realize the level of the storm or the situation. And that, that, that happens time and time again, you hear people say that. And then finally, uh, the other big area is training and exercise on the, on the disaster plan. And this is where it begins to break down, another part begins to break down. It's great if our disaster plans are in place. It's great if we've got all our mutual aid agreements in place. It's terrific if we've got a solid communication system. But if we never practice any of those, in many cases, you'll see the responders, when they get there to the scene, it becomes a first, it's as if they've seen all this for the first time. And that's a, that can become a very big problem because if they don't know by reflex almost what they're supposed to be doing, the scene can very quickly spin out into chaos. All right, we've talked about preparation from the standpoint of normal operations. Now we want to talk about the, we know the disaster is coming, we know the situation is getting ready to occur, and we've got to start getting ready. We really, at this point, the, everything escalates up a, a several notches as we're getting ready for the impending storm or situation. So what do we do in those situations where there's increased readiness as we're increasing our situation and we're increasing, uh, increasing our preparation for the storm? We first want to take a look at our critical facilities. And this is one of the things that people uh, tend to miss out. What, look at your community, and this takes place back actually in this phase, the mitigation phase, is you want to look at what your critical infrastructures are for your community, be it transportation, be it water, uh, power, uh, any of those type things that are imperative for your community to survive. And in this situation, when we're talking about increased readiness, are they prepared to deal with that particular storm? And we want to look at it structurally, personnel-wise, all of those pieces that may create a situation where that critical infrastructure cannot operate. And we want to get it ready, we want to get it ready to deal with a disaster. We also want to make sure we've reviewed, gone through one more time, uh, reviewing our SOPs, reviewing our disaster plans, things like that. As I said before, we've been training on it, we've been re revising and updating it over here, and we're not just putting it on the shelf, we're actually looking at it on a regular basis. At this stage, we want to review through it one more time to make sure we've got all the parts in place. And you know, as well prepared to deal with the, the situation. Um, we also want to begin updating resource lists. Now, resource lists can be anything from personnel we're planning to bring to uh, equipment to any of those things that we will need to have in place to deal with a disaster. Now, something I would suggest, particularly in this preparation phase, is the more of this you can template out prior to the incident, the better off you'll be. Now, you may be asking, what, what does he mean by that? What I mean is that the, one of the easiest ways to deal with a, a, situa a disaster once it's going is to have everything set up almost like in checklists and in kits. So if I'm the public information officer and I'm going to be dealing with the media, I want to have a series of kits over here that has all the equipment I need, everything already packaged up and ready to go. I may have my checklist of what I need to take care of as soon as we're ready, we're back up and operational and we're going. I may also have templated out some press releases that are ready to go. Any of these type things, for operationally, what I may look at is I may say, I want to have checklists of where am I going to put personnel, where is the EOC going to be, all of these type things, and I, I'm all, that way when I'm ready to go and the disaster's passed and we're now responding to it, I've got everything already in place and I can operate fairly easily. We also want to begin mobilizing those resources. Now, here's something to keep in mind. When we talk about mobilizing resources, I'm not necessarily talking about bringing them into the community. Now, think about that for a minute. We've got a hurricane. We've got a tornado that we know is getting ready to move through. 
uh, we have a situation that's going to create a lot of disaster, disastrous results. So what we, what, why would we bring those resources that we're going to need for the response into the community? We want to make sure those are carefully placed outside the zone of the disaster so that once it's passed, we can bring it all in. And an example I would give is, uh, again, uh, the, looking at the uh, situation with Hurricane Katrina. In that situation, FEMA had resources staged back in Alabama waiting to respond after the hurricane passed. And so in that situation, the resources that were needed from the federal government were placed outside the zone of the hurricane so that they weren't, they weren't damaged and became part of the incident as, instead of part of the resources. And so you have to be cautious of this. What I would suggest when you do this is come up with two staging areas, a primary and a backup. And these are outside the zone of where the disaster is coming through. And they're carefully placed so they can get in fairly quickly. And the reason I say come up with two, two places in, in a situation, say we're talking about a tornado or a hurricane, what happens if the storm shifts one way or the other? You want to make sure you have an alternative ready to go just in case. We also want to begin testing our warning and communication systems. We want to get those, make sure those are all fully functional and operational. Now, many communities, they test these weekly. You'll hear on the radio station, you'll hear this is a test of the emergency broadcast system. Um, depending on the community you live in, you may hear the tornado sirens go off and things like that. Those are all testing systems. We're, we're going to run that one more time just to make sure we don't have any problems. And by doing that, that gets everybody familiar one more time of what it sounds like, what the sirens sound like, what the tones sound like, what the messages are going to be uh, coming through so that they can become familiar with it and they can begin focusing on those as the storm moves in. We also want to bring up our public information at that point. Those folks need to be ready to go and ready to operate. And here's something I would suggest. Uh, don't wait till the disaster occurs to find somebody on the scene to go talk to the media. Go ahead and have a, an established position that handles public information. And someone that can basically be there throughout the incident to talk to them, to give them updates, and to keep the information flowing. Because once the incident go, is go, once your response is going, the incident's going, Keep in mind, the media is going to probably be your primary source of getting information to the general public. So we want to make sure they're getting everything they're supposed to have in a very timely manner. You also want to make sure that you, everything's set up, that the media has a place to go. Uh, and this is sometimes often the case that they'll roll into the incident and they may be all over your scene. And that's, that's not uncommon. If you go ahead and have an established place, let the media know where it's going to be so that they can go to get the, the most accurate information. And so we may set up some place near the EOC or out of the danger components that they can, they can set up their cameras, they can set up the microphones, everything like that, and they know that in a timely manner, be it every 30 minutes, every hour, whatever the case may be for this particular incident, they're always going to be getting their information. And they can relay, relay that out to the general public. And so this is often a misconception with the media. We always look at them in a very negative light in a sense they're trying to find something wrong. Well, in these type situations, you can actually use the media to your advantage. Utilize them to get information. Um, I've seen situations where fire departments have used them to, re to release information to the general public. In a couple of circumstances, I've heard where the um, fire department and emergency responders were using the news media helicopters to help get better size up of how, how much damage had occurred. Uh, it helped the media because they were getting live footage they could send back to their uh, station. It helped the fire, emergency responders because they could use it to determine where do they begin. So utilize them to, to your advantage. As well in, the, in this increased readiness stage, we're going to begin um, pulling in our disaster workers. We're going to begin uh, looking at what additional staffing we're going to need to deal with this. And so we begin pulling all those pieces together. So to summarize things up a little bit for this particular part, when we start getting into that increased readiness stage, we want to evaluate our critical infrastructure, make sure they're ready to deal with it and they can recover quickly. 
We want to review our standard operating guidelines and take a look at our uh, disaster plans, make sure those are up to date and prepared. We also want to uh, update our resource lists for what we may need specific to this incident. We begin mobilizing our resources. We also want to test our warning and communication systems. We want to begin disseminating information out to the public and to the media. And we want to begin recruiting whatever additional staff and disaster workers we may need. All right, with, we've talked about the mitigation and how do we begin to try to minimize in our community the, the potential damage and destruction that can occur. We've talked about prep, preparing for a disaster in the sense of not only our normal operations, but as well when the incident begins to, we know it's coming. And now we want to begin to move into this third phase, and that's the response. And this is where our, incident, our disasters occurred, our storms have moved through, um, the explosions occurred, and now we've got to deal with it. And as you can see, what I hope you see through this is that once this occurs, everything goes into action. If any of these other parts are not in place, at that, this point it's too late because you've got everything is going at that point. So this is why this part, well both of these, but this part as the disaster is coming in or you know it's coming, making sure you have those, uh, everything in place that you need. Now, what is the response? The response are actions that will be taken to save lives and protect property. And that, that's it in a nutshell. These are the actions that we're going to do to try to save lives, to try to recover as much property as we can, and to try to begin that process of getting things in order. Now, at this stage, things begin to happen rapidly. So, uh, one of the biggest issues you typically see that where it goes wrong is during this preparation phase, we underestimated how many, the, type, the number of resources and the amount of resources we needed. And when we get here, it's like, oops, what do we do now? We need more personnel. We need more equipment. We didn't uh, allocate for enough uh, food resources or water. At this point, it becomes a very, big pro it's a very big problem at this stage. So this is why the preparation is so important and that we've covered all of our bases there and that we've made sure everything's in place prior to going into the response. All right, when we talk about response, there are going to be several parts that we're going to uh, work through with this. And I want to make sure we, we get everything covered so that you have a good understanding of what is the response piece of it. Now, with the response, it begins the pre, we, we first start out with the pre-impact. That means the storm's coming in. We're already beginning to see some of the damage. We know the, the level of the storm is going to be incredible. And I use that as an example. It can apply to most any situation. And, but in this case, we're talking about a storm. And we're now get, beginning the early response portions of it. What we're doing at that point at, at, during the pre-impact is we're sounding the sirens, we're doing the notification, the emergency broadcast, those things that let the general public know this thing's coming in and it's coming in hard. And we don't want we want to make sure we can deal everybody's prepared for it. You also want to at this point deal with it, any advice you can give people, um, actions or instructions that they can use as, as the, the storm's coming in. And for example, if we had a tornado. And you see this on the uh, news channels where they will come up, come up on the news broadcast and they say you need to get to the center of your room, your house, you need to get to your basement, um, different things like that that may be said to help people understand what they need to do. Uh, as well, a, a hurricane, you, for example, you, you're telling people how to evacuate, you're telling them where to go um, to get out of the area. And so those are things, that, this is the type of stuff that's going on now. You may hear the tornado sirens going off at this stage um, to notify people they need to get below ground or they need to get to the center of their home. Uh, you begin surveying and evaluating the emergency service, uh, emergency situation. In this thing, we're, we're now beginning to monitor, do we have the resource, what are our resources doing and do we have enough to deal with what's going on? And so we're beginning to track all that information. You may see at this point uh, apparatus going out to respond to the incident. You may begin to see uh, the calls coming in for down power lines, all of those type of things that are a part of a storm, a disaster moving through. And you want to begin surveying and evaluating those to make sure you've got everything covered. 
at this point as well, we're beginning to uh, pull together our response and beginning to allocate our resources and begin to look at what, where can we put everybody. And so, for example, I use uh, one community during the May 3rd tornadoes. Um, they took their apparatus for the fire department and moved them out of the community while the storm passed. Once the storm passed, they brought it back in. Um, a number of years ago when uh, Hurricane Hugo came through and, and uh, came ashore in South Carolina, uh, one of the, the barrier island departments actually pulled their apparatus off the island waiting for the storm to pass, then brought it back to handle the emergency response. Um, those are the different things that you see go on during this sort of a pre-impact stage. You begin also mobilizing any other necessary resources. Now this may be everything from volunteer workers, Red Cross, Salvation Army. Um, it may be any food resources you've already allocated out or you've been working with. You want to begin getting those folks mobilized. And as well, you want to get them positioned so that when the st once the storm passes, they can go to work. Uh, at this stage as well, you, you want to let them know that you know once the storm passes, I need you at this location. Or I need you on Main Street at, at the corner of 5th or, you know, very specific information so they know where they need to go. And once everything's passed and they've been uh, activated. You want to also begin um, stepping up your uh, emergency operations center. At this point, you, you see it become active. All the players or members that are involved are going to be there. And you begin, it begins its regular operation, an ongoing operation. At this point also, you may want to begin, this is where you also begin to evacuate your community. And you want to begin take, getting those resources, getting those people out of there if, if necessary. All right, we talked about as the storm's coming in or as the situation is beginning to occur, now we want to talk about what are the immediate, and in this case the immediate emergency that we've got on our hands. Uh, the, at this point, you need to begin prioritizing. We want to begin prioritizing what's important. Obviously, the very first number one priority that we need to be focusing on is saving lives. We want to begin saving lives at this point and getting our teams out there doing the search and rescue, doing the uh, rescue operations in general, all of those things that begin to deal with the life priority that's going on right now. Second, we want to regain control of our community. And what I mean by that is that when an incident occurs of, that ma of, of large magnitude, what tends to happen is you tend to see somewhat chaos around the community. People are coming back out. They're looking to see what damage is done. They're beginning to see what's trying to figure out what's going on. And as the emergency responders, you've got at that point begin to gain control of your incident. And then what we do from here is then we begin to minimize the effects of the disaster. We try to begin to get control and keep further damage from occurring. So what are we doing? We got three priorities here during this. Life safety, number one, first and foremost. And when I say life priority, to keep in mind this is not just about the victims. This is about the responders as well. And this is something we sometimes will miss at the, in this particular stage is that the, there's such a focus on getting the victims, there's such a, a energy put into doing that, that we forget that the emergency responders have to make sure they're taking the proper safety precautions as well. Because if they get injured or they get hurt, then that's, a, that's an additional victim we've got to contend with. That's an additional problem we've got to have, or we've got to deal with, concern with. So we want to make sure the life safety is the number one priority, both to the public and to the responders. Second, we want to regain control of our community and regain, regain control of our scene. And then third, we want to begin minimizing the effects of the disaster. So those are our three priorities. What you begin to see at this stage as well, we've, we've, we've had our EOC in operation now because we knew the situation was getting ready to occur. Now we begin setting up our command posts and we begin to set, uh, ramp our EOC up even further. Because what's, what you're going to find is going to happen is it's going to be a little bit different than what we deal with as a structure fire, what we deal with as a car accident. Because in those situations, we've only got one scene we're dealing with. I've got that structure fire I've got going on. Or I have my car accident. In a situation of a major disaster, it's very likely you're going to find you're going to have multiple scenes going on. And you, it, it would not be uncommon at all to have 
all these different areas operating as their own incidents. And so what you want to do as the fire department or as the incident commander is you want to begin breaking them out so that they can, they can deal with their own scenes, but it's all information flowing back into you and into the EOC. And this way you maintain control of it that way. Instead of one large incident with multiple things going on, you have a number of smaller incidents that are occurring. And so, well, for example, one, may, one situation over here may have their own incident commander. Another one here may have an incident commander. Here, and all of those are reporting back to the EOC. And so uh, th that's a, a good way to maintain control of your scene and try to maintain control of your incident by breaking it down into smaller pieces. I often tell people when, they, when they've, they've got a big problem that's overwhelming to them that the best way to do it is break it down into manageable parts and try to deal with it that way. And we're, we're basically we're doing the same thing here. We're taking this massive disaster, we're breaking it down into smaller parts, and we're assigning people to deal with those smaller parts. And ultimately they end up reporting back to the, the incident commander and to the emergency operations center. So that's, that's how we're going to manage this incident. And then they can call in and say what resources, the additional resources they may need. Say they need somebody from Public Works. The incident commander for one section can call in to the EOC, have those responded. Maybe somebody needs um, help for a family that's lost their home. They can call back to the EOC and have that sent. And so by doing it this way, you, you, you can keep some order to what's typically considered a chaotic situation. We've talked about first the pre-impact situation of the response and how we deal with that and how we begin ramping up for the, the disaster. We've also talked about the immediate impact where we're now, we've now got a situation here where we're trying to manage. And the next thing I want to talk about is what do we do when it becomes a sustained emergency? And in a sustained emergency, what's happened is it's not something we can resolve within a one hour, four hour, six hour period. In these type of situations, and that's what makes them unique, is they could go on for days or for weeks. And you could actually find yourself spending time in this response mode for quite a while. So what do we do at that point? When we're dealing with a response in a sustained situation, what we're doing is we've got to take a look at how are we providing care and treatment for the casualties. What are we doing with those folks that are coming in? As well, we want to... Um, deal with how, how are we dealing with monitoring our responders in a sense are they, they getting proper meals are they are their facilities available to them are there resources available to them to keep them going in these sustained situations and you know for example FEMA typically says uh, for the responders when they're um, when they send in response teams is typically for a 14-day cycle and then they rotate them back out um, if you're, you're dealing with an incident where you're dealing with your personnel are more local, you could see that go a little bit longer. And, but as well, you, as, as the incident commander and as you're dealing with this type of scene, you want to make sure those, that the people that are responding are closely monitored. Um, as well, we, we want to begin collecting, identifying, and uh, storing or dealing with that from the, the deceased or the dead. At this point, remember we talked about what is a major disaster. We've got to, we've got to do something with these bodies, particularly as things, as the, as things are moving forward. Um, we've also got to look at mass care for displaced people in these situations. Uh, we've, we, we now have a lot of people that may have lost their home, may have lost all of those things they consider to be normal, and we've got to provide them th those for the time being until we can begin to move into this recovery effort and we can start to get things back to normal. So we've got to look at things like food, water, places to clean up, um, places to sleep. Uh, the, these are all different things we've got to look at and resolve as part of this response effort and get people going uh, to begin try to rebuild. When we talk about the sustained emergencies, one of the issues you typically see, and it usually begins back in the initial impact of the response, is you begin to get an influx of volunteers coming in and people wanting to help. And keep in mind, what's, what's typically happening is that the incident is being broadcast all over the news. It's making all the media, um, as well even today with the social media. You're seeing it all rolling out on Facebook, Twitter, and all those different type of uh, resources. And what can happen is people want to get involved. They want to help. 
be it people to bring supplies, be it to help look for missing uh, victims, be it whatever the case may be, you're going to suddenly find yourself with a, a sudden influx of people coming in. Now, this, this, this sounds good initially, but here are some things that tend to occur. Uh, if you don't have an area set up for these people to report to, for them to be properly vetted, to be make sure that what they're, that they're assigned to do, what their skill level allows, uh, what will tend, uh, tend to happen is they will tend to wander off and begin getting involved on their own. And this is a very common occurrence that you have these what basically equivalent our freelancers in the fire service is they will begin to wander off and start operating as a uh, responder. And so if you don't, you want to make sure you've got some way of managing those people so that they don't kind of wander off and start getting involved and all of a sudden become a victim themselves. They could possibly do more damage. Uh, those type of things begin to occur if there's not a system in place for bringing them in. Now, one of the things, what I would set up, much like you did for the media in the, in the initial planning for the disaster or immediate preparation, uh, you also want to do the same thing for volunteers. And this way, as people begin to come in, as that influx occurs, then you have somewhere to send them, you have a way of getting them involved. And that this way, you, you tend to see less freelancing and less people just kind of wandering around in the incident. The second issue that typically occurs with this is once the novelty wears off of the incident, they tend to disappear. People, uh, there's a lot of hype as, as you watch the major networks start picking it up. Um, depending on the level of your incident, you, people are wanting to get involved and they're very excited to help. But as you start in, with a sustain, you're get, as I said, you're getting into days and weeks and, that are involved in your response effort. And so, the, again, people grow tired. They, they grow worn out. They've got to get back to their families. And what you, just as, in as many cases, just as quickly as the people were coming in, you begin to see them leave. And so while you may plan based on the initial response of having X number of volunteers two weeks, three weeks into your incident, you may not have them. So this is where some careful planning has to take place and making sure that, again, back early on, and early on here, in here and in this place, we've, we've got the ability to bring in more resources and more people, whatever the case may be. All right, we've talked about several f parts of this uh, disaster cycle. We first looked at mitigation, and we talked about what do we do to try to begin minimizing some of the things that could go on with the disaster. We've looked at preparation both on the daily basis and we've also looked at it from the standpoint of what do we do as we know the storm's coming or the situation's getting ready to occur. We also then looked at the response. And in the response is what are we doing once the incident has occurred? And at that point we're in reaction mode. We're now having to deal with the incident. And if you remember our priorities in response talked about, you know, first life safety as we said, both for the members of the community, the victims, and the responders. We also talked about scene control, gaining control of our incident, and bringing order to that. And then finally, minimizing the effects of the disaster. Now, we, so we, in a sense, we've accomplished all three of those, but what we're looking at now is then how do we begin to return to normalcy, or return to the way we were. And, and now here's a misconception that typically occurs, is there's a thinking that okay, we're in recovery mode, now we're going to get everything back to the way it was before the disaster. And that is not always the case. Uh, sometimes the, the destruction is so incredible that we, we cannot return the community back to the way it was before. And so you need to kind of keep that, if you're the incident commander, you're part of the response, you need to kind of keep that in the back of your mind that we may not be able to get things back to the way they were. But what happens in the recovery phase? We first, we first take a look at our health and safety measures, and we're not talking just for the immediate, like we did in the response. We're now looking very long term, because in the recovery phase, what you can begin, this can actually take quite a while. This is not, now we're not talking at this stage days or weeks. We're now talking months, possibly years. So the recovery phase can take quite a while to get back get us back to where we were before, or attempt to. 
So we've gotten to look at some of the health and safety measures that we can put in place that are more long term and begin to at least provide some people some of the basic needs uh, while we're in the recovery phase. We want to look at ways we can protect and control and allocate our vital resources. Keep in mind, water is at a premium at this point. Food is at a premium. Uh, sanitation is at a premium at this point because those resources may be very limited if they're at all. So we want to make sure we've, we've got some way of protecting, controlling, and allocating those resources out for the long term. Because again, I, the recovery phase can take quite a while. We also want to take a look at reestablishing or um, and activating some of those vital resources. You remember what I talked about at this point in the preparation phase, we were looking at our critical infrastructure, transportation, roadways, our uh, water supply, electricity, all of those things, and we're, we're making sure they're prepared for the incident. Here in the recovery, we're beginning at that point to bring those back online. Now, it may be at a very minimal stage, or it may be at a, a very limited capacity, but we're going to try to begin bringing those back and bringing them online for usage, depending on what the safety situation. We also are going to begin looking at uh, law enforcement beginning to control the day-to-day -day operations and bring order back to those. In this situation here, during the response, we're looking at just trying to get everybody accounted for, get everything in place, try to deal with the immediate issue. Here we're now, again, looking for a long term. So we want to see law enforcement begin to take, take back the day-to-day -day control of the scene and the operations of maintaining order. From the fire service side, we're going to begin looking at how can we begin reducing down that response capability. We're no long, we're at, when we get into this mode, we're no longer in the search and rescue uh, approach necessarily as much as stabilizing and trying to rebuild. And that, that you can look, look at from all agencies uh, that are involved at this point. We're, no, we're, we're slowly moving out of that response mode and everything's in a crisis situation and we're trying to take care of the life safety issues, we're trying to take care of the immediate, and we're now looking longer term and rebuilding. So a lot of things are going to step down or be replaced by something up by another part of the response. We also want to look at establishing access controls in the recovery effort. We also, as well as uh, barricades, ways to control movement throughout the town. And typically what you see in these situations is when the mayor, the governor opens up to allow residents back into the community. This all begins to happen in this situation. And what are they going to come back to? How are they going to move about the town? How are you going to keep things like uh, looting and all of those parts from taking place? These are all parts of, of the, the recovery effort. And as I said, with the shifting taking place from the response to the recovery, here the volunteers that may have been involved at this phase, the initial search and rescue, the initial clearing roads to get emergency vehicles through, the initial uh, helping people get some of their basic needs so they can go back to a shelter, those type of things, is shifting now. And what you're, the volunteer response you're going to see here typically is people coming in to help rebuild homes, people coming in to help clear yards, things that were, may not have been essential at this phase will begin to do so at this one. Now, as I mentioned to you earlier, I said that mitigation is going to take place in each one of these. In the recovery phase, what's going to happen is as we begin to rebuild, as we begin to attempt to bring normalcy to our community again, what you're going to see happen is you're going to look for ways that we can improve the community for the next disaster. So when we're rebuilding homes, for example, we may look at ways we can build, build them better structurally to withstand a, a, a better, worse storm next time. We may look at our roads system as we're rebuilding that to say, okay, how can we create better evacuation routes for people? Um, we may look at the buildings, uh, the, those critical infrastructures we talked about, how can we improve them so that when the next, next incident occurs, we are better prepared, we've got better resources in place, and we can uh, deal with it a lot better than what we did this go around. So what you're seeing is this mitigation is taking place in all of them. 
and, and all these pieces, we're always looking for ways to improve, what, no matter what phase we're in. Granted, mitigation does have its own stand alone, but it, it's, it's going to tie into all the others as well. So, to kind of recap what we've talked about, we've got four phases of a disaster. And if we were to try to begin to look at it in an organized manner, this is, this is what we would go by. We would first see the mitigation process. What are we doing to minimize the disaster, so that the damage a disaster can occur? What are we doing to try to reduce the risk to the people that live there? We then move for the second phase is preparation. And in the preparation phase, what we're looking at is one day to day, are we overall prepared to deal with a disaster? Do we have the plans in place, the mutual aid agreements? Do we have the training? Do we have all of those pieces that we need to deal with a disaster and prepare for it? And then the second part of that, we're looking at, we know that the disaster is coming we're, and we're getting ready to deal with it the immediate. The third phase we move into is the response. And in that response, we're, both, we're, we're now mobilizing our resources. We're now pulling out our uh, disaster plan and we're now making it work. And so we're looking at the response of protecting life, minimizing damage, and gaining control. And then fourth, we've got the recovery. And that's where we begin to rebuild the community rebuild those critical infrastructures, then all the other, other components of the community to try to return us, if not to normal, at least close to normal. And so these are the four phases we're looking at. Now, as I said, from the standpoint of the fire service, in most cases, you're going to be the first one they call. You're going to be the first one on the scene. And in some states, it's even written in the statutes that the fire chief is the instant commander in a, nat a natural disaster. So the fire department, probably more than anyone, any agency, needs to have an understanding of the emergency management process, of the, the phases of a disaster, and how they play into it and how they fit into it. Because there, there's going to be so many occasions where you, your agency will be the one that takes the lead on this. And so I would suggest making sure you have a very good understanding of these phases how they operate, what your department does in that process, and then I would suggest as well expanding beyond the basics, looking at how you can take a great, get a greater understanding of the, the, these phases and how you can expand your knowledge and integrate it into your response because ultimately that's going to be the key. This is good information to know. This is great to have somewhere in a textbook somewhere, but until you can integrate it into your response, it doesn't make sense and it's not applicable yet. So with that, I would suggest going back, reviewing, constantly learning, and looking for new ways to improve the way you're doing this. There are a number of ways you can go get further information and further research this uh, particular area. First and foremost, I'd say begin at the FEMA website, FEMA.gov. And that's a great resource for emergency responders, for citizens, for government officials, business owners, all to begin looking at how can they best deal with a disaster. So that's a great starting point. Second is you can also look at your local library for books and materials on that, from that area. Um, as well, the National Fire Academy offers a learning resource center, which will has numerous resources in this area. And all of those can either be use there or you can check those out from the Learning Resource Center through your local library. And then finally go online. Uh, a number of resources out there, a number of websites that you can look at that will be very helpful to you. In addition to your research and looking for way, uh, resources that way, you contact your, your state emergency management agency and find out about courses that are being offered for in, in this particular area. And there are a number of orientation to emergency management, um, in many cases, they break those out into components and individual courses that relate to these specific areas. And all of those are typically free through your state EMA. Uh, so definitely look at that. There's also through FEMA, there is the Emergency Management Institute in Emmitsburg, Maryland. They also offer courses for free that you can take both online and there on the campus.
I would say at a ba very basic level, everybody in the department should be trained to a, a, a good basic understanding of emergency management. And again, there are a number of courses they can, uh, that people can take. Uh, if you're an officer, you need to know so, some of the more, more supervision type skills that go along with managing a disaster. If you're the chief officer, you need to know some of the planning as well as some of the uh, high level responsibilities that go on during a disaster. And again, all of these are courses that are offered through uh, either the state EMA, through FEMA, through, in conjunction with the Emergency Management Institute. Um, you can also find a number of courses online. But I would say to break it down into what are the priorities, everybody in the department needs to have a good basic understanding. Um, supervisory and, uh, and officer level positions need to have uh, a good working knowledge both at the supervision level and command level. And then your chief officers need to have more of the planning and executive level type understanding of emergency management. This is actually a very common problem that you run into with a major disaster, and particularly when you're dealing with small communities, volunteer departments, smaller departments, where the, victim, the, the responders and members of your department may very well be members of the community. And as well, they're going to be experiencing the same vic, uh, problems as victims, as well as trying to take on this role as emergency responder. One of the key things I would say right away, and this happens in this preparation phase, is you need to make sure that you've got enough resources and enough people coming in to compensate for the possibility of a loss of half, three quarters, or possibly even your whole department. And so that really comes into this, this preparation planning and making sure that those, you have those resources en route. Um, one of the things I always tell people, it's, it's much easier to turn responders around than to call them and get them en route to you. And this is, and particularly as you're looking at this, this is where it really becomes critical. It is much better to have people there that you don't need than to be calling around trying to find people to respond. So I would say definitely look, assume as you're doing your preparation, worst case scenario. And as, as I said, what happens if I lose half, three quarters, or my whole department? How will I still manage the incident? The fire department plays a very critical role in the recovery phase, just as they did in the response. In the response, I, what I would do is make the comparison that in the response phase, compare it to a structure fire and how we respond to a structure fire. In the response phase, what we're doing is we're, at that point, trying to save lives and property. We've got to get the people out of the house, get the fire knocked out. In the recovery phase, I would compare that to salvage and overhaul. And at that point, what you're seeing is the department personnel responding out they're assisting with removing property from the damaged homes. They, you will see them assisting in helping clear yards, helping clear driveways so people can get in and out. Uh, homes can be more visible. And so you'll see more of that type of role. And it's more of an assisting role to the homeowner and to the community member as opposed to in that response role where you may see the, the firefighter take a leading role. And so, again, it's, it's more things like helping them clear stuff out of their homes, helping them... Uh, clear their yards, look for ways, uh, not necessarily in the building context, but to help try to recover what they can from their home or facility. The main gotchas, to use that word, uh, that you need to look for in each phase is first, in mitigation, I'll start with that one. In mitigation, you need to properly assess your community. And typically where you see problems occur is when they haven't done a proper assessment or one at all. And so that, that's where this pro problem really takes place. In the preparation, typically what you'll see is they either haven't allocated uh, enough resources to deal with the disaster or they may not have, put, have those prepared to go. And those are the two things I would say typically happens in the preparation phase. And where you see that is in the response. If proper allocation, uh, resources haven't been allocated, uh, enough people, food, water, those type things, then it really catches up with you in here. I'd say for the response, what typically is the big problem that I've seen is communication. There, it's almost like religiously there's some type of breakdown in communication that occurs in the response. So, and that's why I try to emphasize how important it is 
here at this at this stage while you're getting ready for the disaster to make sure that your pro that proper communication is in place that everybody understands in the recovery phase the tendency here where you see the problems um, is if something has not worked in the response so we haven't say for example we haven't properly secured a building we haven't properly secured uh, some component of the community and we find out about it in the recovery and so this is where you want to make sure prior to moving into this recovery mode that um, the, the community is safe and secure for people to return. You don't want to release that, the community to, back to the public when there's still potential threats there. That's actually a very good question. What do you do when the agencies do not have the established relationship of working together. And in some cases where you may see there's a definite conflict between the uh, two agencies, say police and fire. And in the preparation phase of getting ready for a disaster and in the ongoing development of that, those, step, those relationships have to be established. So while maybe the department heads or chief officers do not get along, it, they have to come together and to make this whole thing work. And that's one of the requirements of the, the, the life cycle of a disaster is that everybody has to work together, be it law enforcement and fire, be it neighboring departments in the fire department, be it EMS, waterworks, all of these agencies, to make this operate successfully, they have to be able to come together. Now, how can that take place? In these early stages of preparation, if you remember I talked about about training and ongoing training as far as dealing with your SOGs, dealing with your disaster plan and so forth. This is where you begin, begin to do that is while the relationships may be tense at first, bringing them together for training and beginning to get them to work through the disaster plan together will begin to build those relationships. Now, you may, you may not be able to get it to a point where there's this harmonious relationship between the two agencies, but at least by doing this, you know that they're all working off the same page. And this is if, if where you typically see the, the response go really south and where you have a lot of problems with it is when the agencies are not communicating and when they're not working together. And in some cases where you may see each agency has their own command post, so to speak, and they're running their own operations independent of the others. And when that occurs, this, things really begin to fall apart. And when, if you see on the news, you see on the media where the, uh, you see that the fire department and the police are, there's chaos there between working with, and in most cases, if you go back, you see there was not some type of joint incident command or any type of communication going on. So it's very important in these early stages here to begin trying to build those relationships, if not a perfect relationship, at least to the point you can work together.